As always, I wish to thank Bonnie and Bill Stubblefield for their vision in establishing a political institute devoted to civil discussion and debate, and to the Institute's Manager of Communications and Events, Sarah Burke, for her outstanding work in producing tonight's program. I also wish to thank our sponsors, WVU Berkeley and Jefferson County's Medical Center, Meritus Health, and Valley Health System. Uh, and just a reminder that you can help support programs like the American Conversation Series, along with student scholarships, research, and other exciting Institute endeavors by joining the Friends of the Institute. You can do that simply by going online to stubblefieldinstitute.org. That's stubblefieldinstitute.org and become a friend of the Stubblefield Institute. And now for the introduction of tonight's guests. Uh, Grace Marie Turner, and who, by the way, Grace Marie has been has had some technology challenges either on our end or her end. So she will, as I understand it right now, still be on the video, but joining us by a mobile phone as, as I am getting the information from Sarah. Uh, Grace Marie Turner is the president of the Galen Institute, a public policy research organization that she founded in 1995 to promote an informed debate over free market ideas for health reform. She is the founder and facilitator of the Health Policy Consensus Group, which serves as a forum for analysts from market-oriented think tanks around the country to analyze and develop policy recommendations. Len Nichols is a recently retired professor of health policy at George Mason University and is now a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute and Professor Emeritus at George Mason. He was director of the Center for Health Policy Research and Ethics and was a professor of health policy at George Mason University since March 2010. Dr. Nichols has been intimately involved in health reform debates, policy development and communications with the media and policymakers for over 25 years after he was a senior advisor for health policy at the Office of Management and Budget in the Clinton administration. Wendell Potter is a former health insurance company executive who walked away from his job at Cigna in 2008 after what he described as a crisis of conscience. Wendell went on to write Deadly Spin, a New York Times bestseller. His most recent book, Nation on the Take, has been called by historian Doris Kearns Goodwood, a stirring guide for uh, how we can work together to reclaim our democracy and reunify our country. Mr. Potter is one of the nation's leading advocates of the policy known as Medicare for All. Moderating the panel is Susan Denser. Susan is one of the nation's most respected health and uh, health policy thought leaders and a frequent speaker and commentator on television and radio, including PBS and NPR. Susan is also an author of commentaries and analysis in print publications such as Modern Healthcare, The Annals of Internal Medicine, and the New England Journal of Medicine, and the NEJM Catalyst. She is the editor and lead author of the book Healthcare Without Walls, A Roadmap for Reinventing U.S. Healthcare. One word on the format of tonight's forum is that all videos and microphones have been turned off this is to provide the highest degree of security for our participants and disruption, potential disruption of the event. Audience questions were sent in advance of the program. You may also choose to ask questions, I think, via the, the chat function, but don't take, uh, don't take uh, that as gospel because I'm not really sure. But I do want to just bring in Susan Denser. Den Susan, this is now your program. We are so happy that you agreed to moderate this panel. I think it's the most interesting American uh, conversation series that we've done uh, to date, and I'm really excited about it, and I know our audience is as well. Susan Denser. Thank you so much, David, and I want to echo you in welcoming everybody else and joining us for this important discussion tonight. I'm really pleased to be here with several people who individually are formidable thinkers and speakers in their own right. And I believe the conversation among all of us is really going to provide a 360 degree view for the audience on how we should think about health and healthcare in the United States and how we might as a nation continue to move to make things better. In my other life, I'm a senior policy fellow at the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. 
and I spent a lot of time thinking on that subject uh, as my colleagues do. So I know we'll have a re robust conversation among the four of us. Please do feel free, as David said, to submit your questions via the chat function, and we'll take as many as we possibly can get to this evening. We're going to start today where we are, uh, which is to say in the midst of a historic pandemic. As all of you know, just today it appears we have passed the estimated 200,000 person death threshold in this country. We have more than 6 million COVID cases in the United States. Uh, countless more people, of course, have fallen ill and suffered, and some of them are still suffering even after the immediate throes of the disease have receded. If we look at how the states are faring amid COVID, we see that several of them are trending better. Others are facing uh, uncontrolled community spread, about 18 of them in that category, and things don't look good in the balance of states. And there's obviously great uncertainty about what the future holds as we move into the fall and winter whether and when we might develop effective vaccines against the virus and all kinds of other issues that we face. So the first question I wanna to put to our panelists tonight is, how has COVID altered the discussion of health and healthcare in the United States? How are we having a different discussion about these issues today than we would have had if we hadn't encountered the pandemic? And Len Nichols, let's start with you on that. Okay, Susan, and thank you for doing this and for uh, all my panelists for joining us. I'm looking forward to a great discussion. I would say COVID has revealed, maybe you could even say shined a bright spotlight on inequities that have long been present. The disparities and the vulnerability, uh, racial and ethnic in, in actually contracting the virus uh, and, and the likelihood of contracting it being a function of where you work where you live, how you get back and forth between work. I was always embarrassed and, and quite taken with the fact that I'm not essential and I got paid for working at home and the people who are essential uh, by the definition we all used in every, in every part of our country uh, often don't make a living wage. And so there's something really wrong with that. And I would say the implications of these inequities turn out to be similar to what the research on social determinants of health has been teaching us for quite a long time. And, you know, as I like to say, economists think they invented this about five years ago, but social workers have known this stuff for about a hundred years. So the, this, this knowledge has been around that income and class and, and race uh, really matter in terms of, of access to the resources you need to stay healthy. And then I would say, and I'd be remiss if I did not say that the George Floyd kind of deaths and the protests that followed exacerbated a sense of unmitigated inequities that we've all tolerated far too long. So to me, what this, what this pandemic and everything that resulted this year have done is it made it clear to me in a way it wasn't before, we need to take structural racism seriously. We need to make sure that all Americans get the care they need in order for this American experiment of ours to thrive and to continue. We need to fund public health and we need to listen and take seriously the science that comes out of that. And we need to pay more attention to the conditions that are upstream of the healthcare system. And I'm talking about housing, food, transportation, complex case management, social isolation, we need to do that in order to improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of our healthcare system. We can't solve healthcare unless we also embrace our need to deal with social issues as well. That's what I learned from COVID. Thanks, Len. And that really has added that important uh, dimension to the conversations we may be having next year around health reform. So let me go next to Grace Marie. Grace Marie, how would you say the pandemic has altered the discussion over health and healthcare in the US. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with you all. And I, once again, I could not agree more with my good friend, Len Nichols. He really did underscore many of the problems in our health sector that the pandemic has, has exposed harsher light. 
But I want to talk just for a minute about some of the things that we've learned. Sorry, sorry. We have the incredible versatility of our health sector and being able to respond rapidly, particularly when the government gets some of the rules and regulations out of the way that were really that would have been otherwise impeded the ability, for example, of doctors and nurses to be able to move from one hot spot to another without going through cumbersome licensing uh, protocols in a state. So there have been a lot of things, the, the deregulation efforts in the FDA to really accelerate and warp speed the um, pharmaceutical company's ability to come up with both treatments and hopefully a vaccine to the pandemic. The manufacturing facilities that have turned on a dime to be able to repurpose their their factory lines to be able to produce the equipment that's needed from everything from face masks to ventilators, and all of the, the flexibility also that we've seen uh, in care delivery mechanisms. One, the second thing I think that's important to look at is how important it is for us to have other forms of care, other methods and systems of care delivery. We've seen, again, through the relaxation of rules allowing telemedicine, that people have just left at the opportunity to be able to visit their doctor virtually when that makes sense. I think there, in some areas, it's like a 400% increase in use of telemedicine. So I think that that is important and something that we can learn from. I wrote a piece for Forbes that so far has gotten about 2 million hits talking about how doctors were very concerned and I think probably still are, that patients that don't have COVID but have other chronic or serious illnesses are afraid to go to hospitals or even their doctor's offices to get care. There are too many reports of people dying at home from heart attacks because they didn't want to go to the emergency room or suffering crippling strokes that could have been treated if they would have gone to the hospital. So people need other secure forms of care, and I think telemedicine is certainly a big start, but certainly a lot more use of, of, of IT systems of all sorts in order to facilitate access to care. And then finally, I think it also has shown the importance of portability of health insurance. We want everybody to have health insurance, but it should not be, you should not have the risk of losing your health insurance if you lose your job, if you're furloughed, if you, if you move to another area, that, that health insurance needs to be secure and something that you can own. So I think we really need to think about the kinds of ways people get coverage so it's more secure. And then finally, I think we've also seen, Susan, as you mentioned, the, how different every state is. And even within a state, how different a locality is. In New York City, for example, New York is the, the, case, the, death, the death rate from COVID is five times higher than much of the rest of the country. And it puts New York way at the top of the chart. But New York City is very different from the rest of New York State. So even within states, we need to be able to tailor our health care system so, people, so that government officials and, and physicians and the medical community can have the flexibility to respond to the, meet, to the need on the ground. Great. Great. Well, thank you very much, Grace Marie, for putting those additional uh, important topics on the table. Wendell Potter, I want to come to you next. How do you think the, co the COVID-19 pandemic has shifted the healthcare debate? You know, I think it is, uh, has shown that uh, we have very structural flaws in both how we finance healthcare in this country and how it's delivered. Uh, one of the things that I used to do in my old job at Cigna was handle financial communication. So I uh, always kept a, a, a keen eye on uh, how the company made money and how our competitors were making money. And one of the things we've seen during this pandemic is that uh, my former employers, Cigna and Humana before that, have done extraordinarily well. Um, and, and in fact, the, all of the large for-profit insurers, including United Healthcare, the largest, have set record profits during this pandemic. Uh, while a lot of, uh, of, of hospitals and, and caregivers have, have not fared well at all, we've seen 
that many physician, physicians and physician organizations, physician groups are, are struggling to keep their, their doors open. Uh, the other thing uh, that I think is important, and I will agree certainly with Lynn, that we uh, need to really address in this country more than we have the social determinants of health. Uh, we need to invest much more in public health than we have. It's been estimated that only about 3% of the more than three and a half trillion dollars we spend on health care in this, this country goes to, to public health. And we're seeing the, the consequences of that. Uh, Lynn is exactly right that those who are most disadvantaged, who are dying in record numbers or disproportionately are uh, people who have low incomes and people of color. Uh, so we shouldn't have a, a society in which uh, those who are, are most likely to be affected and die from a pandemic are those who are, are um, essential workers and, and those who are, are struggling to pay the rent. Uh, the other thing that uh, we're, we're seeing is that the employer-based system that we have is very flawed. It's been crumbling for many, many years. Uh, during the debate earlier this year of the Democratic candidates, uh, often candidates would say that we need to protect the employer-based system, that 150 million Americans depend on the employer-based system for their health insurance. Uh, and that is true. Uh, but you could have said the same exact thing uh, in 1998, when there were then about 150 million people who got their coverage through their employers. Since that time, the population of this country has increased by 55 million. Uh, so it, it's not been stable at all. It's been declining. And one of the organizations that I lead is called Business Leaders for Healthcare Transformation. We represent about 3,200 uh, employers across the country. And many of those uh, no longer are able to offer coverage to their workers. In fact, uh, over the course of the, the last 20 years, the percentage of employers uh, that are able to offer coverage to their workers has been uh, steadily declining. In 1998, 99, about 70% of, of the nation's employers were offering coverage to their workers. Now, uh, fewer than 50% are. So we've, we've seen a, a steady, steady crumbling of the employer-based system. And we're, we're seeing what's happening as a consequence when people do have access to uh, healthcare through their employer. If you're laid off uh, or furloughed as 45 million plus Americans have been, you also in many cases are losing your health insurance. And uh, it's been estimated that about at least 12 million of those who've lost their jobs uh, have lost coverage for themselves and their families. So we shouldn't have a system like that we need to make sure that everyone has access to the care that we all need. And we need to look at different ways for financing our healthcare system and delivering healthcare in this country. Great, well, uh, we have a lot of diversity of perspectives already coming into play as we would have expected and indeed are, are happy now to uh, plumb these steps a little bit further. Uh, the one area of agreement, though, I think I heard among all of you is this acknowledgement that we have fundamentally poor health among much of the nation, that those sources of poor health really lie outside the healthcare system. They are the upstream factors that Len mentioned, the so-called social and economic determinants of health, that our healthcare system hasn't done a particularly good job of addressing them, even though, as Grace Marie said, we can look at some aspects of our healthcare response amid the pandemic and say it's been good. Uh, maybe it took us a while to figure out some of the details of the virus, and of course, we're still doing that. But it's very clear that uh, mortality among people who become severely ill with COVID is actually has improved a little bit over the course of the pandemic as we've gotten better about figuring out how to treat people with COVID. So there are some strengths, obviously, in the healthcare system. But as you all have said, there is this underlying issue of the poor health of much of the population and the disparities in health and the inequities in health that the healthcare system so far hasn't been able to redress. So let's stay on that topic for just a moment more. I know Len gave some thought. Uh, express some ideas about what, what needed to be done. But if we were to imagine that we had a health improvement agenda 
over the next four to eight to beyond number of years, what should be on that health improvement agenda? What could we agree as a public that we really need to do to invest in health? So let's do a little bit different order this time. I'm gonna start with you on this one, Wendell. And again, we're talking health now, not health care per se. Yeah, and I think that's, that's very important because uh, when you're talking about health, that, that, is, uh, that, that is a broad term that does encompass addressing the so-called social determinants of health, uh, which are uh, affected by uh, the neighborhoods that you live in and whether or not you have access to um, uh, housing that uh, is suitable and, uh, uh, and, and, and water and uh, the, the quality of the air that you breathe. Uh, those all need to be looked at and addressed. And we've, we've not done a very good job at all of done that at, at all. And uh, we, as I said earlier, we haven't devoted very much funding uh, to, uh, to, to public health and to really determining what we can do to make sure that people uh, lead, are able to lead healthier lives. Uh, when I was in the industry, uh, my company and others would sell wellness programs to employers, but they've shown that they're those, that's not necessarily uh, uh, an appropriate way to try to improve the health and well-being of individuals. Plus, you also have the, the, the problem of people who are not, uh, don't have access to programs like that. But public uh, community health centers and, and, and organizations like that can, if they have sufficient funding, uh, play a significant role in identifying the reasons why people have underlying health issues and address them. We have uh, a, a huge problem in this country uh, that uh, impact someone's uh, uh, longevity and their health. Uh, that certainly includes obesity and, and other factors that uh, uh, are associated with that. And that's been also one of the contributing factors to the problems uh, during this pandemic. We've seen those who uh, have chronic uh, illnesses, diabetes in particular, among those who are, are most in danger. So we really need to focus on what can we do? What can our public health infrastructure in particular do uh, to look at the various reasons why we have such an unhealthy population? We have one of the, uh, uh, the, the country has, our country has the, one among the highest rates of obesity in the world. So what can we do to address that? What can we do to address the high rates of asthma, certainly in, in communities of color in particular. So as we know, and you, you, you have mentioned the low level of public health funding in the country relative to our healthcare system funding. We know that uh, public health funding at the federal level, which basically is money that goes out to the states to carry out their public health activities. We know that that has fallen in real and absolute terms over the past decade. And we know that the states cut back a lot of their public health spending in the Great Recession and to a large degree did not restore it. So going to you, Grace Marie, do we need an agenda to beef up public health funding? But absolutely we do. And I think one of the things we're seeing here is when we really talk about what the problem is, we see a lot of unanimity around agreement about the problem. And I think we can just take that next step to figure out what do we need to do to really get to, to solutions. One of the reasons I think we have seen the um, COVID impact so much more people of color, people with lower incomes is what we've known for a long time that there is a direct correlation between income and health. The poorer you are, the more likely you are to suffer from chronic conditions for a whole host of reasons. And particularly in the, in the pandemic, we've seen that people with lower incomes, particularly in inner cities, are often in multi-generational uh, households where one person goes out and works at a job, maybe as a, as a first-line health responder, and come back and the whole family is much more likely to be infected. So I think that there's, a, there's part of the structural problem is really an, an income problem. But there, we do need to do a much better job than we are of providing access to primary care. I think Wendell is exactly right that providing people access to a wellness program means we're gonna help you with the diet program and we're going to put a gym in our company. 
Well, there's a lot more to the primary care and to, to wellness than that, and particularly access to primary care, and particularly for those with chronic conditions. There was a story in the New York Times several years ago about a New York City hospital that wanted to do a better job of taking care of patients with diabetes because they were coming in at, a high, at advanced stages of their disease, and then they were much more likely to be hospitalized. And they said, you know, what if we were to do an outreach program to provide care to people in their home, don't make them come to the hospital, but really provide better access to care, to care so we can avert these crises. And it was a very successful program, hugely popular, but the hospital actually shut it down because the board said, what's happening is we're losing revenue because people are not coming in for the hospitalizations, which provided greater revenue to the hospital. So there's a real mismatch about incentives here. Actually, fortunately, a private nonprofit foundation supported and began to support that program, but it shows you how misaligned the incentives are in our system. We have to get back to a system that rewards doctors and, and hospitals and everybody in the health sector for keeping people well, doing a better job of managing care rather than just dealing with crisis management when someone presents at a hospital. Community health centers can be a huge component of that but it also really requires a lot of structural changes in the health system to untangle a lot of the financing and incentives and the rules and regulations that keep them from doing what we all know is the right thing for our health sector. And we will come back to that topic of financial incentives and the issues that we have in our still largely fee-for-service healthcare system in a moment. But staying for now on the topic of health, Len, earlier you were talking about some of the things, areas in which we needed to invest. And as Grace Marie has just uh, reiterated for us, the primary drivers of health status in life really are incomes and education. If we were to make a big difference in health, we'd invest in raising people's incomes and education levels, among other things. Would we not? And what do you think the agenda should be in that regard? So I'm all for that. Lord knows, I think we need to do more uh, to equalize incomes and, and, and basically life opportunities. But I'd like to start agreeing with Grace Marie. Let's start with the regulations, okay? Because <laughs> turns out there's a lot you could do to just empower a whole bunch of people uh, to do a whole lot better than we're doing now. If you start focusing on health and not health care, and you start focusing on total human well-being and not just the specific siloed mission of a particular agency. Imagine, if you will, the following. Imagine a cross-agency task force, with inc which includes a lot of people from the private sector and a lot of people from local areas. And imagine that task force is given the charge by the next president to actually break down the barriers that prevent you from cooperating. Like, let's enable Medicaid to buy an air conditioner for a family with a child with asthma so we don't have to pay for 15 ED visits and a couple of hospitalizations every year. Let's empower Medicare to put ramps in people's houses who could stay at home and avoid all kinds of issues if they could just get around in their own home. Let's empower, indeed, if you will, force agencies to cooperate. I am told on very good authority, because I used to live at OMB, you know, and we all have a drink once a year. There are people there who understand that a lot of what prevents true creativity on the ground at the local level is fear of crossing a line that is made blurry by guidance, which comes starting at OMB, but also from the agencies. My point is there could be a heck of a lot more cooperation than there is now, spending probably less money in total than we spend now, and still improving health across the board. So I imagine something like that. Now, Lord knows we need more money in public health per se, and we're probably going to have to put some more money in housing in, in general. But I'm telling you, we can achieve a heck of a lot more health for a way less extra money than, we're, than you think if we just get smarter about allowing this creativity to cross across the sectors that we've, we've hampered ourselves by our myopic view of what each 
agency's charge actually is. I want to bring in another topic that we have uh, glancingly addressed, but, but we can go deeper on this, which is the role of insurance and insurance coverage, and particularly making sure people have coverage in order to get access to those, whether it's community health centers, whether it's uh, hospitals uh, that uh, maybe in the future will be conducting more proactive diabetes prevention programs. You can't get in the door to most places in this country without health insurance, or you certainly can't get in the same door that you get in with health insurance. And we've seen, according to the latest Census Bureau statistics, we're now looking at an estimated 26 million people who were without health insurance all of last, uh, all of uh, 2018 and 2019. Uh, about 9% of people were not covered by health insurance at the exact time the uh, investigator showed up to interview them. So somewhere between 26 to 30 million people are experiencing uninsurance over the course of a year. And that was before the pandemic set in. I think there's still a lot of discussion and debate about how many people are actually becoming uninsured as a consequence of the pandemic, as opposed to moving to other sources of coverage, including Medicaid, but we know the uninsured numbers are going to go up as a consequence of the pandemic. And indeed, although our health insurance uh, levels, or, or I should say our uninsurance levels are still lower than they were in 2010, they're higher than they've been in the last uh, and they've been going up for the last several years. So it looks like we're creeping back up into this problem of rising uninsurance in the United States. I want to ask each of you, what do we do about that now, especially in light of the pandemic? And Grace Marie, this time I will start with you. You're, you're very fair. <laughs> Good <approach. laughs> The Kaiser Family Foundation uh, did a study, I believe last year, that looked at who the uninsured are. And they found, surprisingly, that 99% of people who are in the United States legally have access to health coverage. Most of those who are uninsured simply have not enrolled. About 4.5 million people are eligible for employer-based health insurance, haven't signed up. Others are eligible for the for coverage through the Affordable Care Act, but perhaps can't afford their share of the premium, even if they have subsidies. Feels maybe the deductible is so high that the insurance really isn't worth it. Another four million or so make incomes that are high enough to, to purchase health insurance, but they can't find coverage that's affordable. One dad in Fredericksburg, Virginia, told me that the only plan available for him in a single in the, in the individual market, costs four thousand dollars a month for his family. He said it's either buying health insurance or paying my mortgage. I can't do both. So looking at that and, and the Oregon experiment, the Oregon Oregon had a certain a fixed number of slots of new people who could new people who could newly enroll for Medicaid. Forty percent of those who won the lottery didn't sign up, even though it's free. So I think that we've got to look at the programs, look at Medicaid, for example, and think about whether or not that program needs to be reformed so that people have better access to care. If you're on Medicaid, it can be very difficult to fight to get access to a specialist. You may have to go to a hospital emergency room to get care simply because you might have a, otherwise a six-month wait to see a specialist. So there, there's a lot that needs to be done to reform access to care and to make sure that people who are enrolled are signed up. Most of the, of the remainder of those who are uninsured are in the United States, not legally. That's really a separate problem. It's not a healthcare problem. It's an immigration yes, problem. You know, you Looking at insured, I think it's important to think where is it? Your own I think I have some bad very, very funny that way. Yes, uh, we've got a little bit of background noise. Uh, let me ask all, all other participants to mute themselves if you would. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, okay, so 
as you were saying, Grace Marie, very important to make sure that people who are eligible for programs do sign up for those programs, perhaps make it easier in uh, many instances for them to sign up for those programs and stay covered. What about this issue that you've just pinpointed, which is affordability of coverage? Uh, it does remain very, very expensive for people. And that, of course, ties back in part to just the sheer cost of our healthcare system and our high prices. But what would should be done on the on affordability grounds to make coverage right. more affordable? As we all know, the number one issue in healthcare, the election after election is the cost of care and the cost of coverage. The cost of coverage is a reflection of the cost of care. And there are so many distortions in the system that make people with insurance basically not care how much something costs because once they hit their deductible, then the insurance company pays for, for most of it, if not all of it. Certainly the same thing is true with Medicare and Medicaid. So there need to be some, some, some ways of giving people incentives to get better, better value care, which means not necessarily cheaper care, but better value. We've seen instances where even, even a COVID um, COVID treatment can vary by tens of thousands of dollars, depending upon where you get it, even though it may be basically the same, the same treatment that's given. So we, we have a, a really crazy pricing system. There actually are some regulations to, to address the Stark rules, which were created several decades ago to make sure that doctors didn't, didn't basically double dip and profit from treatments they were being offered, but we're in a very different world now with managed care and being able to give more flexibility to doctors to provide better value care and to make sure that people have an incentive to try to find that best value care, I think is really, really important. Price controls just don't work. They've never worked in 4,000 years of history. We've got to find a way that sort of percolates up to a better system, again, of incentives to give people more of, a, more of an incentive to get better value in their health care, and that will bring down the cost of coverage. Okay, let's go to Wendell now on this question of both the uh, lack of insurance and the rising rate of uninsurance. And of course, Wendell, you've been an advocate for Medicare for all. Let's bring up that part of the discussion. Why do we need to move to a system, in your view, of Medicare for All to deal with this question of guaranteed coverage for all Americans? You know, I, I came to support uh, Medicare for All somewhat late. Um, uh, and I'm sorry that Richard Master couldn't be here because Richard has, uh, is, I give him much of the credit for encouraging me and bringing me along to understand some things about uh, what he advocates, which is better care for all than, than I'd been able to consider uh, his point of view from, a, from, a, from an employer. Uh, but uh, the, the reality is that uh, we not only have a problem of people who don't have insurance, but people who are underinsured. Uh, and it's because in many cases, because uh, uh, people are uh, not able to meet their deductibles, so they are underinsured. When I, and Grace Marie is correct, you can look at the data and draw some conclusions about those who are, who are uninsured. I was in fact working on a, a white paper shortly before I left my job in the industry. It was a, a white paper to try to persuade Americans that the problem of the underinsured wasn't all that great. You can slice and dice the data in certain ways. Uh, before the Affordable Care Act was passed, by the way, the number of people without insurance was getting very close to, to 50 million. Uh, one of the things I was not to include in that white paper was the fact that many people at that time were uninsured because they couldn't afford premiums. Uh, they had pre-existing conditions and if an insurance company was willing to sell them the policy, they couldn't afford it because it was based uh, on health status. Uh, if they were buying it, certainly on their own. Uh, and in many, many cases, they couldn't buy coverage at all, period. Uh, because of the practices in the industry of refusing to sell coverage to people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, one of the things that became abundantly clear to me was that uh, the company that I work for and others in the industry 
are not really themselves interested in, in, in covering us all. They want to make sure that as they grow, it's profitable growth. I can't tell you how many times my CEO told us that our growth has to be profitable growth. And to make sure you've got profitable growth, you have to make sure that those who are enrolled in your benefit plans uh, are not going to be filing a lot of medical claims. So you've got that. But I will say also that uh, uh, it is a problem of people with in low incomes uh, as well who cannot afford coverage. Uh, yes, we do include people who are undocumented and in, in our count of those who are uninsured. But uh, one of the things, uh, the, the events that really triggered my decision to leave was going to an outdoor clinic, not terribly far from West Virginia in Wise County, Virginia, not too far from where I grew up in Tennessee. I uh, went there out of curiosity while I was visiting my family. And uh, I, I learned when I got there, there were, there were people who were lined up waiting to get care for hours. Uh, and they were in, this, in, in rain, they were soaking wet, waiting to get care that I noticed at this county fairground led to barns and animal stalls. So these people were waiting to be treated in barns and animal stalls. It woke me up to see, to realize just the, 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 the circumstances that so many people in this country are in. I, le I learned that day that a lot of those folks uh, would love to have had insurance, uh, but most of them, and they most, mostly had jobs, but they worked for employers that did not offer coverage uh, and they couldn't afford to get it uh, uh, through the individual market, certainly back then, because uh, uh, there were no subsidies. There were no, no ways for people to be able to buy coverage that they, uh, at, at that time without, without subsidies. That continues to this day. The, the crowds at these uh, free clinics continue to swell. I also learned that day that a lot of those folks said they were told by their, their insurance companies, they were in these high deductible plans, uh, that, uh, sorry, we can't do anything for you because you are in these plans, uh, but you might check out Remote Area Medical, which was the organization that was putting on this free clinic in WISE to see if they might uh, have uh, a clinic nearby. So we, we've We've been on this journey of moving everyone into high deductible plans. So not only do we have a growing problem of people without insurance, we have a growing, in fact, a more rapidly growing problem of people who are underinsured. The Commonwealth Fund estimated earlier this year that about 40% of people who get coverage on the Obamacare exchanges are underinsured because they look primarily at premiums and not so much at uh, out-of-pocket cost. And uh, they're, uh, in many cases, really is going to be struggling if they get sick or injured in these plans. Uh, the, the, the problem with the uninsured, though, is one that is continuing. And, and we have a system that is not really structured in a way that makes it possible for people to get the care that they need. Portability is one thing. It's one of the things the Affordable Care Act did want to try to make sure that people, if they lose their jobs, uh, they at least have the ability to get coverage uh, uh, through one of the exchange plans. Uh, insurance companies can no longer refuse to sell you coverage because of a pre-existing condition of charging more. But still, uh, the, the premiums are increasing every single year as are out-of-pocket expenses. And that is why you have more and more Americans with insurance who are turning to GoFundMe or the bankruptcy courts. Uh, when I was in the industry, uh, as we were uh, pushing high deductible plans, we use the term consumer driven healthcare uh, as a, a term to try to cover up exactly what these were, which are high deductible plans. Uh, but we don't have the information that people really need. There is a lack of transparency. People are not able to really shop and make prudent decisions uh, at the time of need. Uh, if you're having a heart attack, you're not gonna necessarily be in the position to shop for the best care. Uh, and if you're in a high deductible plan, uh, you're, you're going to be facing a lot of, of uh, out-of-pocket costs in this country. So, Len, uh, as uh, David noted, you're, you're now retired, but I bet you could go back through your own files and find several decades worth of memoranda about how to deal with high health care costs in the U.S., uh, and of course, as we know, there was a commission back in the 30s in panel to deal with just this precise question. Uh, 
is the number one issue around uh, health coverage in the US, does it trace directly back to this issue of the lack of affordability of our system and the high prices of our system and how in various ways those costs are indeed passed on to consumers, whether it's by requiring them to pay high premiums or requiring them to pay high deductibles or any other way that we structure coverage. Well, Susan, as you, Grace Marie and Wendell all know, when I started trying to reduce costs in America, I was a foot taller and had a red beard. So yeah, we've all been at this a while and we failed miserably. I think in fact, the most embarrassing statistic is there's a strong correlation between healthcare cost growth and the number of health economists in the United States. So we, we've completely failed here. But uh, seriously, I think it's fair to say that absolutely cost is the root of the problem, but it, it's really cost of the system, right? I mean, if you look at the, the sort of, what's a family premium today, which would cover and compare that to the median family income, all right, and the, the family premium today takes about 27% of the median family income. Now that says a lot about income growth over time and healthcare cost growth over time, but it, it says it all in terms of, we have made a system that almost half our people can't afford. All right, and so we have two choices here. We could say, well, Let's just assume that it's survival of the fittest and only those who get a job good enough get to have coverage. Or we could try to do something about this and doing something about this again is two pronged. We're gonna to have to subsidize people in the short run, no question, way more than we do now. But we also have to get serious about a tackling healthcare costs. And that social determinant stuff I talked about earlier is part of that, but not all of that. We gotta get way smarter about what we buy and we'll probably get to that later, but let me speak to coverage specifically because to me there are two big reasons that people react the way they do and why they remain uninsured as Grace Marie pointed out. And the first big pot of people there are people who are not taking the private insurance they have access to either because they work for an employer and they think their out of pocket premium is too high and or their deductible is too high or they could be ineligible for employer insurance ineligible for Medicaid, I'll come back to them in a minute, have access to the marketplace that the ACA set up, but they're choosing not to buy it. And I think it's fair to say a lot of the health economists in my camp, those who are a little bit left to center and wanted this all to work perfectly, we under anticipated the sticker shock that we were going to impose on people who had been uninsured and suddenly we say to them, okay, now you can buy insurance at a sliding scale but the deductible you will have will be five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000. And they looked at that and they said, let me get this straight. You want me to pay a premium that I wasn't paying last year, but I got to pay 7,000 bucks out of pocket to get any coverage at all. I don't think so. And that's, that explains the people who didn't buy non-group and are not buying employer. On the Medicaid side, I think it's fair to say that a way to think about that problem, it's less about the people and more about the institutions who end up treating them. The folks who have access to Medicaid but don't sign up have a lot of stuff going on in their lives. I would just say that it's very complicated. None of us can really relate. And, and, and healthcare, health insurance is not in the top 100 of things they're worried about. They're worried about how to eat, how to get their kids fed, how to get safe, all that stuff. But when they show up in a hospital, they typically could be made eligible if we do all this right, and they should be signed up on the spot and kept on the spot. Then what's gotta happen, Susan, is those folks need a whole lot of loving and helping them see the advantage to them of staying healthy. But before you can get to that, you've gotta solve their physical and social problems of just getting through the day. So I would say they're a special case. The thing we can do something about in the short run are the people who are not buying private insurance because it's too expensive. And to do that, in the short run, we have to subsidize them more. In the long run, we've got to bring costs down. Okay, well, this gets us to the topic then of healthcare and the current election campaign. And of course, we know that the position of Joe Biden, former vice president, 
now with the Democratic nomination running for the presidency is essentially we need to shore up the Affordable Care Act in several ways, particularly we need to extend the subsidies to people higher up the income level beyond four times the federal poverty level, partly to deal with the question that you, the issue that you all have just surfaced, which is to make health insurance more affordable for people who are also experiencing sticker shock, even though they're relatively well off. And then, of course, another part of the Biden plan is to tie those subsidies, the premium tax credit subsidies, to a higher actuarial value of the health plan, the so-called gold plan. That's complicated stuff, but in essence, it's about raising the subsidy level. The vice president has also proposed a public option and a Medicare buy-in for people age 60 to 64. So that's on the one side. On the other side, Donald Trump tells us that he has a health plan coming. We haven't seen the details heretofore. We don't have the details now. Uh, he has said he wants to cover pre-existing condition or eliminate, continue the elimination of pre-existing condition restrictions. And he's also in, on record now in supporting the lawsuit that would render the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional. And there's obviously a little bit of conflict between those last two pieces, how you continue to protect coverage of pre-existing conditions uh, and yet uh, see the Affordable Care Act go down as it might if the Supreme Court rules a year or more from now uh, with and uh, favors the original plaintiffs in that case and renders the ACA unconstitutional. So those seem to be the polar poles of this discussion. Let's wade into that at this point. And Wendell, going to you, as between all of that, what should happen? And if Medicare for all is not really on the table among these two candidates, should it be on the table? I think it should be on the table. And I think uh, it actually might resurface. One of the things, and, and, and I was on panels with Grace Marie uh, uh, more than 10 years ago now when we were debating what became the Affordable Care Act. And of course, then a public option was proposed, it passed in the House and uh, was stripped out of the Senate version of the legislation. So we didn't have that. But I do think that, uh, uh, but also back then, there was not nearly the strong and organized support as there is now for Medicare for all. Uh, in the House, uh, H.R. 1384, which was introduced uh, uh, by Congresswomen uh, Ramila Jaipal and Debbie Dingell, uh, more than half of the Democratic caucus is signed on as co-sponsors. And I think we'll see after the election uh, and next year uh, in January that the legislation will be introduced again as it will be probably by Senator Sanders in the Senate. Uh, so you, you have a lot more support for Medicare for all than you've had ever in the past. Uh, and I think probably uh, we may see more members of Congress sign on as co-sponsors of that. Whether it moves through the committee system remains to be seen. Uh, but uh, with regards to what the Biden administration might do if there is a Biden administration, I do think that their preference would be to improve the Affordable Care Act. And I think that's worthy. I said at the time that the Affordable Care Act was passed, that was worth passing, but we needed to see it as the end of the beginning of reform because there were a lot of shortcomings and we've seen some unintended consequences of the legislation. He does propose uh, a public option uh, as he had supported uh, uh, several years ago and President Obama supported. Uh, they both said, or at least a senator, uh, uh, President Obama said that we need that to a uh, public option to keep private insurance companies honest, and 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 I couldn't agree with that with that more. I do think that uh, establishing a, another option for people uh, would be uh, something that I think we could support, depending on how it's structured. If it is a a plan that doesn't require high out of pocket cost, uh, then I think uh, and, and would be open to uh, a lot of people as the the legislation. Uh, 10 years ago took shape, it would not have covered nearly as many people as I think we've been open to as many people as it should. Uh, uh, Vice President Biden is also proposing to lower the age of eligibility to, uh, to 60, uh, which is a start and something I think that would be uh, supported by a lot of people. Uh, President Trump, uh, yes, he has said that he has a plan coming any day now, 
uh, but we haven't seen it. And uh, uh, he's been in office now for nearly four years. I'm not sure that that's a, uh, something that we can put a lot of stock in. The other thing I think that, you know, he at one point said, uh, who knew this could be so hard? Uh, one of the hard parts is trying to figure out how can you uh, maintain the uh, prohibition against uh, uh, discriminating against someone because of a, a pre-existing condition. It's very, very difficult uh, to do that. Uh, and if you strike down the Affordable Care Act, as is, is very possible with the uh, Supreme Court uh, as it is now, uh, that could be uh, increasingly difficult for uh, the Republican Party and, uh, and President Trump to, to um, fulfill that promise. Uh, it's hard because, as I said earlier, uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act, insurance companies routinely uh, refused to sell coverage to people with a pre-existing condition or charge them a lot more. Uh, if that goes away, uh, it's going to be very, very hard to come up with a, a plan that, in my view, that would uh, uh, protect people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, so we very possibly and very likely would go back to the way things used to be 10 years ago. So Len, let's go to you. Is the Biden platform on healthcare the right approach? Uh, should there be a broader agenda of health reform than the vice president has proposed or even a narrower one? What is your perspective on that? Well, so I, I tend to be a person that uh, sort of thinks about the ideal, but then I look at the choices on offer, okay? And if the choices are the Trump platform or the Biden platform, I will definitely go for Biden. Uh, I agree with Wendell that um, the ACA left a lot of people with uh, unsustainable and, and, and costs that are just too high. And they, you know, we can all remember why that was done and, and you know, budget targets were hit and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, we didn't do enough to make it attractive enough to get more people to take up private insurance in the marketplace or through their employers. And I think it's fair to say um, uh, drug prices were not attacked at all. And, and there's no question we got to do something about that, that. And there's some things you could do that not too hard, like just let Medicare negotiate and see what happens. But I think it's fair to say that the public option is really the biggest, if you will, deal and the biggest risk in the Biden plan. And I say it's the biggest deal because it could if done as expansively as Wendell just described, be the place where everybody else could go. It could become that glue that would complete the circle and get everybody covered who's not now covered. Um, but it's the big risk because the, the fundamental question with the public option, Susan, as you know quite well, is what payment rate is it gonna pay? You know, we can argue about deductibles all you want. What really matters here is what's the payment rate? And I'm guessing that uh, Grace Mee will remember the payment rate that came out of the house in, in 2009 was Medicare as is payment rate. And some of you may remember, I actually wrote a paper with John Burtko, a real live actuary. And we argued, if you're gonna have a public option, it ought to pay market rates and not pay Medicare rates because a lot of people don't know, but right now about 95% of hospitals in this country have negative Medicare margins. Now that doesn't mean they couldn't become more efficient, but it means they're not efficient now. And if you impose Medicare rates across the board, you would bankrupt a whole bunch of hospitals really fast. So we're not gonna do that. So the question is how much above Medicare will the public option pay? And I would say that's where the rubber meets the road, Susan. And I have to say, you know, part of the, Wendell's right, a lot more people support Medicare for all than did 10 years ago, five years ago, I think. I mean, I think, it, I think it's way bigger than it was. Part of it, Wendell's fatigue. Democrats are just tired of fighting. It's, oh, hell, let's just do single payer. But when you look around the country, around the world in a serious way, where are the countries that are, if you will, more like us, less like England? And I'm talking now about Switzerland and the Netherlands and Israel and Germany, where they have insurance and they have universal coverage and they manage to do it without killing each other. Now, how is that possible? Well, they have more defined rules than we've ever had in our country. And I see Wendell nodding and I know he and I both agree on this, but they also have 
choice and they build in choice because Americans like choice. And I would say, even though maybe some of us don't understand it, there's a large chunk of our fellow citizens that don't trust government enough to say, okay, fine, you go handle this. And so that's why I would say the public option is a metaphor for two things. It's a metaphor for getting everybody covered finally. And it's a metaphor for getting serious about cost containment. And the last thing I will say is that I can imagine a world, and I could not imagine this five years ago, but I can imagine a world in which a public auction came into being. And in order to not disrupt everything else, because if it pays the wrong rates, it tilts the playing field one way or the other. What if the public option actually came in and set up a system where all insurers could pay the same rates and thus you move competition to customer service and move it away from who can cut the best deal with the best hospital in town. And that might be a way, and Lord knows, I know Grace Marie's gonna say, Lynn, you can't do price controls. I don't want price controls either. The last thing I want is 3000 prices in 3000 counties. But what I do think is think about, think about common global budgets. Think about big buckets. And let's just say, this is what we're gonna pay in Cleveland. And it's gonna be different than what we pay in Texas and in California and Northern Virginia. But let's have all, all payers pay roughly the same and let people compete on stuff that matters to other people, to citizens and patients, not just how good a payment rate can I negotiate. Anyway, I think something like that, along with the Biden business and my social determinant task force is a really good set of policies. <laughs> So, so Len, you're talking, it sounds like a variation along the lines of what the state of Maryland now has, which is all payer, an all payer system across hospitals. And it is expanding that now into a, a broader way of getting a, a kind of a global budget around the exactly. system. Is that what they're, you're talking about? They're tiptoeing toward a global budget and I'm gonna welcome them to that end because I think that's, that's the solution. That gives the right incentives everywhere. Grace Marie's right. If we don't get the incentives right, none of this is gonna work. And to me, global budgets enforced by a consensus that, you know, what are we willing to pay for? Well, that, that's what we have and that's what we gotta deal with. And I, I, I've never met a hospital CEO who didn't agree with the following. If you give me five years and a target price, I will hit it but I need time and I need to know you're going to keep your word. <laughs> you're going to keep your word. You keep your word, I'll get my cost down to what it's got to be. So Grace Marie, let's go to you. First of all, I want to ask you about the, the Trump position on healthcare versus the Biden position. But I also want to ask you about the public option. The most recent Kaiser uh, Family Foundation health tracking poll actually showed that a surprising 42% of Republicans are favorably disposed to a public option. Now, of course, we don't know exactly what a public option would look like, as has been said, but does that suggest that there's broader appetite across parties for, as all of you have said, another mechanism to drive lower healthcare costs, lower healthcare insurance pr prices and premiums for people? and also guarantee the access to that coverage. So Grace Marie, start with, uh, with Trump versus Biden, if you would, and then public option. Well, the, I do think that one of the things we're seeing in this public debate and the support for the public option, the fact that half of House Democrats support Medicare for all is really a general feeling of frustration. You know, we've gone through the whole 10 years of trying to implement the Affordable Care Act. And yet we still have many of the same problems that we had at the beginning. I'm reminded of a, of a comment that, that the late professor, Princeton professor, Uwe Reinhardt, a health policy guru economist that all of us learned from. He said back in the 1970s, people were saying the rise in healthcare costs was completely unsustainable. That was when it was about 3 or 4% of GDP. It's now 17, 18%. And he said, at some point, we're all going to be living in hospitals and we're all going to be getting our housing, our food, and, of course, our medical care because we're all living in a hospital because the whole economy is going to be devoted to health care. Well, clearly, that's not sustainable. 
but that's the trajectory we're on. So I think people are just saying, stop, we've got to figure out some other way to deal with this. And so I think you're really looking at two different, two different philosophies. President Trump, people say, doesn't have a plan, but he's been doing a lot of things on health reform through executive order. He created health reimbursement arrangements, a way for people to have more portability, more security in actually owning their health insurance. Association health plans, allowing people to buy health insurance across state lines, allowing small businesses to aggregate. That's in the courts. But, but the idea is allowing small businesses to get some of the same economies of scale that large businesses do. Transparency, executive orders, other things. Newsflash, I think we are likely to be hearing pretty soon from the president on, on his health reform vision and plan going forward. I think he's got to get something out there in the campaign and obviously sooner rather than later. So stay tuned. I think that's coming. But the basic thing, I think, is a very different philosophy. I testified four times last year on Medicare for All. There's huge interest in this issue. But I think it is primarily frustration and primarily that it's got a really great name that people can identify with. They love Medicare. Why can't we all have that? But when you do look at the details, you start to see some of the same problems that Lynn was talking about, that the CBO has said that if, if we were to pay all doctors and hospitals at the same rate that Medicare pays now, 40% of them would go under. So it's really not sustainable. We've got to find a different solution. With the public option, that is pretty close to the co-ops. Remember the co-ops that were the sort of the, the, the substitute for the public option. Since that was pulled out in the Senate bill, it allowed states to each create a health care cooperative that was basically a public health insurance plan. I think all but four of them have gone under and leaving millions of people, probably tens of millions of people, scrambling to find other coverage. And it was because they were not well enough funded, not well enough managed, a whole lot of different reasons. So I think we need to think really carefully about the public option and how it, how it would be structured. I think it very likely could turn into something that would make it very difficult for hospitals to compete. So finally, the different philosophy, I think, is whether or not we have a system that tries to fix it to add more fixes from Washington. We can tweak this, we can tweak, tweak that, we can create a new program. Or we figure out that we've got to have a bottom-up solution. If Washington were to provide more flexibility and more resources to the state, we could see if Maryland's all global budget, all payer system would work. Let's experiment at the state, but let the state figure out what works for their citizens, certainly with federal guidelines, certainly with requirements that people have options and choices. And then finally, I've been working for the last two years on a plan, Lynn, as you know, called the Healthcare Choices Plan. And it really is designed to make sure that people do have choices, different kinds of coverage that work for, that work for them and their families, that there's an incentive for companies to compete, not just on taking care of only the healthy, but doing a better job of taking care of those who are sick, who are vulnerable, who have pre-existing conditions, and providing specific resources to states to allow that to happen rather than, as in the ACA, basically putting in the same pool with everybody else and, and cross-subsidizing them with higher premiums. We can do a better job of taking care of the vulnerable, giving people more choices, giving incentives to the system to to make prices more affordable, both for coverage and for care, and also to do a better job of primary care so people don't have to wind up in the hospital, but they can get cared for earlier. Let me just say, I, I wish Grace Marie was in charge of the president's plan, and maybe she is, and she's not going to admit it on TV, but I'll just say we'd all be better off if she was. But I do think she's right. There's a really big philosophical difference in these perspectives. And in my view, one party wants to cover everyone and one party wants to maximize liberty and cover as many people as 
their charity will allow. And I think that's a big difference. And that's a fundamental difference in the party. Now, I'm not saying Grace Marie's there, but I'm saying that's where the president and his party is. They're quite willing to let millions and millions of Americans go without coverage because that's not a priority for them. And I think that's where it, what it comes down to. And so if you want to cover everybody, you got to do some stuff. And one of those things you got to do is provide more subsidies and more rules. I believe you can do that in a way, and I'm pointing to Switzerland and the Netherlands and Germany and Israel. You can do that in a way consistent with liberty and consistent with freedom, but it is going to require more money than uh, I believe it's fair to say the president and his allies actually want to spend. So I want to take a little bit of a pause here and just summarize some of the ground that we've gone over here. Because I will say there does appear to be some really strong consensus among the three of you on what we need to do, as well as obviously some points of divergence. All of you said very clearly we need to attack the social determinants of health. We need to do that by addressing the upstream drivers of health status. We need to spend more on public health. Uh, and we need to do a lot more in the current health care system to get the incentives right. We haven't talked a lot yet about the fact that we still have such a volume-driven, fee-for-service-driven system, but I do sense that all of you believe that we've got to move more on getting the incentives right so that we're driving better care and better outcomes for people as opposed to more volume of care. You've, we, I've heard a lot of uh, sentiment around ongoing experimentation, particularly if we do that at the state level, uh, uh, Grace Marie, as you just said. Um, and at least two of you are in favor of preserving a significant number of choices in our system, that a one size fits all system is not the right answer for this very, very heterogeneous country. Uh, the points of divergence really are more on the viability or visibility of a public option or even going further as Wendell would like to go to more to a Medicare for all, which of course would trade off choice against uh, potentially greater security for individuals and maybe, maybe lower spending. Although, as you all have said, a key question in any kind of Medicare for all or public option arrangement is what are you going to agree to pay providers out of it? And as we know, some recent studies have shown that right now, most hospitals in America are paid by commercial insurers on average two and a half times what Medicare is paying. So there's a big distance between what Medicare is paying and what commercial insurers are paying. And maybe there's room to find a happy medium there, but that's exactly what either Medicare for all or public option would require. Let's go with that sort of uneasy consensus on many issues, but difference of opinion on others. Let's just go take a couple of questions that did come in from the audience. Uh, one questioner asks, uh, health insurance doesn't equal health care. I think we all stipulated that. Uh, doesn't it make more sense to guarantee all medically necessary health care through a single source of financing, which provides care for everyone, Medicare for all? So what is wrong with that? Uh, if the, if the notion really is to drive to better health as opposed to more insurance options, why not go for Medicare for all? Len, take that if you would. So, you know, it's interesting uh, how um, the Medicare for all, I would say the, the most zealous, and I wouldn't put Wendell in that camp, but the most zealous ones focus on giving people absolute choice of provider assuming that all providers now working would still work in the Medicare for all world. But I'll just say, you know, we've learned a lot in the last 20 years and Grace Marie talked about some of this, the flexibility in our system, a lot of managed care organizations actually manage to deliver better care than fee-for-service Medicare is delivering, at least as the data that I have seen and the research studies that I have seen and, you know, correcting for selection and all that stuff and I just look at how low income people of color, they're more likely to choose Medicare Advantage than they are fee-for-service Medicare. And what's that about? That is about getting a more convenient, a better way of accessing the full panoply of whatever I might need. Most of us don't know a lot 
about what we need. Most of us don't understand the healthcare system. Good God, it's incredibly complicated, even for us on this on the Zoom call. So the notion that you would have fee for service, unfettered, go go to any doctor you want anytime. I, that just squares in the face of what I know to be the best care, which I know I get through managed care organizations. Now, um, that doesn't mean that you don't want to have the principle of universal coverage and the principle of making access to care affordable. But again, I think you can do that with regulated private insurance. I, I would like to ask, why not Medicare Advantage for all? To me, Medicare Advantage for All is the is almost the apotheosis of, of preserving choice, allowing different insurers to compete, but with regulations that would force them to compete on the right stuff, and it would be a melding of the Affordable Care Act and Medicare, and would solve all the problems. So I'll I'll leave it with that. Okay. Can I say one thing? I Grace Marie, please. Thing, the crucial thing from our questioner is the definition of medically necessary. If you have the federal government deciding what's medically necessary, you're going to wind up in a situation that virtually all the care that's being given now, somebody thinks is medically necessary. And so it'd be very, very difficult for the federal government to make that decision. And I think it would, it would ultimately very quickly lead to Medicare for all because anybody providing that service doesn't want to lose the revenue and anybody needing that service or believing they do is going to insist on it. So. So I do think that we need a more sophisticated system. And then finally, the countries that seem to have gotten it right on health care, like Switzerland, for example, where they, they do have an individual mandate, you have to buy coverage, but people have a lot of choices down to the Canton level. And one of the things that, that you see is that Switzerland is about the same size as Massachusetts. So a country that's perhaps more of a homo homo homogeneous, and not the right way to say it, but having, um, having a population that sort of buys into the solidarity principle, or a state like Massachusetts, which actually was doing better before the ACA with its own state-based plan, I think that it's, it's the smaller scale that allows you to really fine-tune the system, which is why I think that moving power and control away from Washington, but with rules, and I do, I know, I know Lynn knows that I believe in universal coverage, but just a different pathway to get there. And I think we can get there with resources for the state, more flexibility, and, and finding some of these federal laws that keep people from, keep the system from being as efficient as it can. So Wendell, in the interest of squeezing in one more question, and since we think we know where you're coming from on Medicare for All, I'm going to jump to another question. And I'd love you to start with this one. Uh, a questioner asks, why do we need insurance companies? Uh, why not have one system, have a choice of providers, obviously, within that? Well, in Europe, uh, as we have been discussing, you have private, highly regulated insurance companies. The, this insurance system, those insurance systems are not like that in the US. Those countries do have a sense of social solidarity, and they're willing to tightly regulate insurance companies. What, what uh, obviously you're thinking of a system that wouldn't have private insurance companies as part of it, but would there be a case for moving to a more European model of greater regulation on insurance companies, maybe a little bit more structuring of the choices, or do you think that that's a dead letter for the US as well, that we just really need to move beyond private health insurance? Well, I think we need to move beyond the kind of private health insurance we have right now. Uh, I worked for uh, very large for-profit health insurance companies uh, several years ago. Uh, almost all uh, insurance companies were operating on a nonprofit basis. Uh, then uh, we saw a turn in that as more even the Blue Cross plans began to convert to for-profit status. And things changed. Uh, in the other countries uh, around the world, I, I actually do think that we should look at Switzerland, at uh, Germany, the, the Netherlands, and uh, maybe some other countries as well too, and how they've organized. Uh, they, not, the insurance companies that operate there are uh, very regulated, very structured, and uh, operate on a nonprofit basis, which is important to, to consider. Maybe not universally, but for the most part, they are. Uh, we. Uh, could, I think, the, the term single payer is, is one that uh, is 
open to, I think, interpretation. Some would think that it is only something that applies to the Canadian type of healthcare system, which is a, a single payer system, uh, or the UK, which uh, it certainly is, but uh, uh, not many people in this country are advocating necessarily for a, a UK type of system. But I think you could learn more and, and borrow some more and maybe uh, implement something more uh, close to what the European countries that you've mentioned uh, uh, already have. Uh, uh, Grace Marie mentioned Uvi Reinhardt, who's among others is, uh, before his death and just his last book is called Priced Out. It was published just after his untimely and unfortunate death. I've talked with his, his widow uh, uh, recently and I know that uh, the two of them, and she's carrying on a lot of the research that he had done, uh, think we should look abroad and look at the experience in Germany in particular, but also uh, Switzerland and the Netherlands. They, but, but, but here's the thing, we talk about choice uh, and it is not choice of health insurance companies that, uh, uh, that Americans find most value, uh, uh, valuable. Uh, in fact, we have a bewildering away array of, of insurance companies in many cases and people do not often make the right choice. Uh, there's not enough information so we, that we have that. Uh, so people are often making the wrong choice and finding themselves in plans that have too high deductibles and they are on the hook for more money than they have in the bank to, to pay out of their own pockets. Uh, so I think that, that we could learn a great deal and maybe have a better chance of moving toward a system like the Germans and the Swiss and the, uh, the Dutch have. Great. Well, we started a little bit late, so we'll go just slightly over while I ask uh, you all a final question. So let's say it's January 21st, a, a new president or another president or the same president is uh, who's been given another four years, whatever the case, it's a new presidential term. You are writing two memos, but they're very short, and you're going to keep them short as you discuss them. One is, here's Mr. President, what you need to do in the first 100 days. And the second short memo is, by the end of your first term, what the country really needs done is this in healthcare. So two short memos, kind of Twitter length memos, but here's what needs to be done as soon as possible in the first 100 days, and here's what needs to be done uh, by the end of your first term. Len, start us off the, down this road. Uh, thanks for letting me go first, Susan. So I, I would say, look, the first 100 days, make my social determinant task force a reality and make it clear that your administration is gonna focus on health and not health care and even beyond health to well-being and, and so forth. We've got to cooperate, collaborate, do the things we can do now together in a better way than we've been doing. And that means local flexibility big time that Grace Marie's talking about. Second, and this is you know for the four years, four years from now, I want to I want to accomplish two things. I want to have every American covered. I want to make sure they can get the care they need one way or another. And number two, we're going to convey to our healthcare system, we are going to get serious about costs. We are not going to be your enemy, but we are going to get serious about costs because we cannot allow increasing shares of GDP to be claimed by our healthcare system. And we're going to work together to bring that down. And that, that, that's going to be my legacy. Great. Thank you, Len. Grace Marie, you're next. Your two short memos. First hundred days, I think, has to be looking at, looking at the campaign, looking at the discussion over health policy, and coming up with a real clear sense of where there is some consensus. One of the reasons we are having such a polarized debate over health reform in this country is because either one side wins or the other side does, and we keep passing health legislation on a partisan basis. One of the reasons that Medicaid and Medicare have been so structurally sound is because it was passed on a, on a broad bipartisan basis. The same thing with the with HIPAA, the same thing with the state children's health insurance program. If you can build bipartisan consensus, work with Congress, not on getting pushing your agenda through, but something that you believe both sides
sides can agree on, much like we are today, and begin to build a platform to get that through Congress as soon as you can, because that will show the American people we're doing things differently. We're going to try to build consensus. We're going to listen to all of the American people because health care affects all of us and pass those first steps of reform that can get us to a better place. And I agree with Lynn. I think that the president, at the end of his four years, has to deliver on the question, on the issue of cost, getting costs under control so people feel that they have both access to care and coverage, but they also can afford it. Nobody is there now, and if we don't fix that, I think we're going to wind up with a reactionary solution rather than a sensible, thoughtful solution. Great. And Wendell, you get the last word in your two short memos to the president. And mine would be very similar to, to Lynn's. I think he's exactly right. And I do agree a great deal with what Grace Marie has said. I, I do think uh, right out the bat, you really need to address the social determinants of health and the reasons why people of color uh, are so disproportionately affected, not just during this pandemic, but broadly, and why uh, they are more, more likely to be uninsured uh, and underinsured as well too. So we've got to do something about uh, inequities in healthcare. You mentioned the term uh, uh, one size fits all. And that is a, a term that is used by uh, the so-called Partnership for America's Healthcare Future, which is funded by my old industry, the insurance industry, the drug industry, uh, and some of the hospitals. Uh, it's a catchphrase. I think Americans do want to make sure that all of us in this country uh, have at least access to uh, the care that we need. Uh, and I, so in that regard, I think that's, that's, that's not accurate. I think we do as Americans understand that all of us are in this together. We need to make sure that uh, our children, our grandchildren, our next door neighbor has access to, uh, to good care and that we don't, have, we don't lose it if we lose our jobs. Uh, so that's one thing. And I think uh, uh, we also have to make sure that we're not focused exclusively on bringing down the cost of premiums or controlling premiums. Uh, to paraphrase uh, uh, James Carville, it is not just the premium, stupid. You've got to take into consideration the total cost of health care. Employers are uh, really hurting in this country. Richard Masters' uh, company is paying now uh, about 30 or the total cost of a, a family policy now at his, his company is $30,000. That, that's the equivalent, as, he's, as he tells me, of about $15 per employee. That is not sustainable. So in the, the longer memo, you've got to make sure that our employers are uh, uh, being considered as well too. This system is not sustainable for them or for the people who work for them, much less the rest of it. So we really need to move as quickly as we can, certainly before the end of the next four years of an administration to get us to universal coverage and people having access to the care that they actually need and can afford. Well, I, I believe all of you have uh, closed on perhaps the most powerful point of consensus of all coming through this uh, discussion tonight, which is we have got to deal with costs. Uh, we have potentially kicked the can down the road again for a number of years on cost. It will be at the forefront, uh, as, as all of you have implied, on the agenda for the next president, the next Congress, and indeed all of us as citizens. So with that, I want to thank our three panelists for a really vibrant, robust, far-ranging discussion. And I'm going to turn things back over now to David Welch to close out the evening. David, over to you. Well, thank you. I want to wish, I want to say thank you to all three of our great panelists, Grace, Ma Grace Marie Turner, Len Nichols, and Wendell uh, uh, Potter, and uh, Susan, especially to you. You just did uh, such a fabulous job. And I'm so proud to be the director of the Stubblefield Institute because, well, except for Wendell, who came in at the last minute, I got to handpick everybody for this panel and, and uh, the moderator. And I think that we did a pretty good job. This was a terrific uh, evening uh, for the Institute. And I just can't uh, thank you enough. You guys were just uh, fantastic in the way in which you approached this 
very serious issue. I suppose we could go on for another hour and a half. I would remind our audience that this was also streamed live on Facebook and it is recorded. So you can actually go on our Facebook and share it with other people uh, over the next few days. And I think we should do a lot of that because I think there's a lot of people who didn't get to hear it live or see it live uh, that need to hear these different points of view. But thank you all for joining us. And don't forget, you can become a friend of the Stubblefield Institute. It's very easy. Just go on stubblefieldinstitute.org. And with that, I just want to say good night, everyone. Great evening. Thank you. Thank you.